keynote speaker is Michael Dietz. Uh, Michael is professor at the Boston University and director of the Ecological Forecasting Laboratory, where he combines fieldwork and numerical models uh, to tackle his uh, science questions. And today, Michael will talk about uh, the 21st century science for 20, 21st century environmental decision making, the challenges and opportunities of near term uh, iterative environmental forecasting. Um, Michael, you can take it away. Uh, thanks. Um, so, in an era of rapid uh, environmental change, we can no longer uh, manage. Uh, the environment based solely based on uh, historical norms. Uh, we need to be able to anticipate how systems will behave in the future, both under the status quo and under different management scenarios. Uh, because of this, forecasts are going to be critical uh, for effective 21st century environmental management, and they are an, an imperative way uh, to make our science more relevant to society. Um, I can't speak to the full breadth of the disciplines within uh, CSDMS, uh, but as someone trained as an ecologist, I find that most of the modeling in my community has been uh, focused on longer time scales, prim primarily climate change responses. Uh, and those are time scales that do not necessarily match with the needs of many uh, environmental decision makers. Um, and an iterative approach to forecasting uh, involves confronting predictions with new observations and updating uh, your predictions based on that new information and learning. Here I'm going to argue that this iterative approach provides an important win-win because it uh, focuses predictions back onto decision-relevant timescales uh, while providing feedback in a way that embodies the principles of the scientific method and accelerates learning by continually testing hypotheses uh, that are uh, quantitative, specific, and that therefore falsifiable. Uh, in some cases, this iteration approach can occur on daily or sub-daily timescales, such as these forecasts, uh, one of vegetation phenology and the other of lake turnover probability, uh, which are both forecasting critical system transition dates. Such forecasting approaches are increasingly possible due to advances in sensor technology, uh, network science, remote sensing, and community science, citizen science initiatives. In my own lab, we are developing a wide range of forecasts, including forecasts for land surface, carbon and water fluxes, vegetation technology, aquatic productivity and algal blooms, uh, ticks and their small mammal hosts, and the soil microbiome. Looking across this broad range of forecasts, we are interested in better understanding the patterns of predictability across systems. In particular, the predictability of any system is going to be determined, at least in part, by how fast uncertainties grow from some initial uh, estimate of the uncertainty uh, through time or space till we hit some background level that kind of defines the limit of predictability. So that rate of growth is itself going to be uh, affected by things like initial conditions, the drivers, the parameters, uh, statistical random effects of heterogeneity and variability and process error. And it's really important to understand which of those uncertainties dominate different types of forecasts because they have large impacts on how we understand systems and how we can make predictions about them. Uh, my group is particularly focused on terrestrial ecosystems where we've been working for the past uh, 10 or 12 years on developing PCAN which is a multi-model informatic system which supports uh, data ingest, model execution, anal analysis, calibration, benchmarking, and the archiving of both uh, model outputs and the repeatable workflows that underlie them. Uh, PGAN is the foundation for our data simulation system that we use for it iterative forecasting. Uh, and this integrates multiple uncertainties, uh, such as this showing illustrating initial condition uncertainty, driver uncertainty, and parameter uncertainty integrating those into probabilistic forecasts. Um, we then update those forecasts uh, with a range of different observations, depending on the, the scale and, and uh, scope of this particular study. Uh, in this case, using a, a novel uh, Tobit Wishart ensemble filter, which is a generalization of, uh, of more things like the Kalman filter approach, ensemble Kalman filters. Uh, 
And I wanted to briefly highlight three applications of, of this system. Uh, the first was an uh, analysis that's now in a, a preprint uh, that is partitioning the uncertainties in a, a multi-decadal hindcast of carbon, uh, of carbon forecast, in this case, primarily looking at above ground biomass. And we find that the, our ability to predict above ground biomass was dominated uh, by initial conditions, which are represented by all the, the hashed areas. The initial condition uncertainties are very interactive with are there uncertainties, uh, as well as uh, process error. Uh, it's important, you know, I would argue that this is an important finding because it calls into question a lot of the status quo in the modeling approaches that are used in the terrestrial carbon community, uh, which for frequently ignore both of these uncertainties. And, you know, we very rarely estimate and propagate process error into our, our process-based models. Uh, and frequently these models are initialized by a spin-off uh, that's really not tenable if, if initial condition uncertainty is the dominant uncertainty. Uh, we're also using this system to make automated forecasts of carbon and water fluxes. Uh, they're driven by 16-day uh, weather forecasts. And these, you know, as the dates you can see here, these are, these are true forecasts into the future uh, that we can then validate on an, a rolling basis with things like eddy covariance data. Uh, and we've also scaled up uh, these approaches to a, a continental scale where we're applying them in a historical uh, reanalysis, which is different than just a hindcast because we're, actu we're actively assimilating uh, observations of different carbon pools and fluxes through time to generate a synthetic fusion of models and data over time, very analogous to how many of us work with atmospheric reanalysis as drivers to other models. More broadly, uh, Near-term forecasts are emerging across the field of ecology, uh, but up to now, these have largely been isolated endeavors with uh, work going on in, in aquatic communities in isolation from disease efforts, in isolation from terrestrial ecosystem efforts. Uh, and, and we really have come to believe that this lack of community has been slowing our progress uh, because of a lack of sharing, a lack of communication, a lack of community tools and a kind of a lack of overarching shared theory about ecological predictability. Uh, so in, in 2018, we launched the Ecological Forecasting Initiative, which is an international grassroots consortium that aims to build a community of practice around iterative ecological forecasting uh, with a vision of using forecasts to better understand manage and conserve natural systems. At its heart, FP is uh, working to advance this idea that iterative forecasts provide this win-win uh, by simultaneously allowing us to tackle grand challenge scientific questions about overarching patterns of predictability in nature while producing societally relevant forecasts that improve lives and likelihoods. Uh, most of EPI's work comes from its working groups, which are organized around a series of cross-cutting themes that represent uh, areas of shared interest across the community, regardless of the specific subdiscipline that one is working in. So working groups on things like diversity, education, partnerships, theory, uh, social and decision science, methods, cyber, and cyber infrastructure. Uh, the Partners Working Group is, is really focused on, on building bridges that span academia, agencies, industry, community science, and stakeholders, while the Social and Decision Science Working Group is focused on how forecasts could be used to improve decisions, as well as how are they actually being used in practice. Our Diversity Working Group is focused on building a diverse, equitable, and inclusive community, while the Education Working Group is focused on uh, de the development and refinement of open courseware and supporting educational opportunities in this area. Uh, one recent and important one that we were really proud of is, is the development of a, a series of videos in, that we co-produced with NEON, the National Ecological Observatory Network, uh, on the fundamentals of ecological forecasting. Our cyber infrastructure and methods working groups are focused on the more technical bottlenecks of producing forecasts, things like developing open archiving standards for forecasts, uh, common tools and community cyber infrastructure, uh, and kind of trying to achieve an uh, economy of scale across the community rather than a lot of independent development efforts. And then finally, our theory working group 
is taking this com uh, comparative approach similar to what I talked about in our own research uh, to better understand uh, when and where nature is predictable and looking at the common features that affect the predictability of ecological forecasts, whether that be uh, the, the evolutionary phylogenetical, phylogenetic history of the system or you know, the constraints of the physical environment it, itself. Uh, so there's a lots of ways to get involved with FU. We have a lot of great information on our, our webpage, ecoforecast.org. I encourage folks to, to sign up for our newsletter. And I also wanted to really uh, mention uh, that just last week we had our, our own virtual meeting that was supposed to be in Boulder as well, um, where we launched uh, uh, an open forecasting challenge using NEON data, uh, which spans a wide range of, of different systems, terrestrial and aquatic, ecosystem uh, and uh, population, including things like eco-hydrology that might be of interest to, to members of this community. Uh, with that, I guess I'll take questions.